Hello. <laughs> so this is my book, and uh, <laughs> it's a fashion memoir. And I thought I'd better write everything down before I start forgetting it, because I've been in fashion for like nearly 40 years. So um, why did I call it The Asylum? I call it The Asylum because as I was thinking of the stories that stood out for me, <clears throat> the ceiling falling down at Michael Coors in the 80s, you know, Anna Winter, Kate Moss, Tom Ford, all these different people that I've had interaction with, I thought the, the fashion world is simultaneously a refuge, but it's also an asylum as in nuthouse. So both meanings of the word asylum, and that's how I came up with the title. So I'm going to talk about one particular chapter, and then we can do Q&A. So in this book, there's a chapter about The Devil Wears Prada. Now, how many of you have seen the movie? That's just about everybody, right? So when um, The Devil Wears Prada came out, I tried reading it, and I decided quickly that having sex with a dead relative was infinitely preferable. <laughs> what an awful thing to say. I'm sorry, madam, you had to hear that. So, um, and here's why I had such a problem with it. Um, it. For me, fashion is, as I say, this refuge. It's a place where people go who don't fit in in more conventional environments. They're gypsies, outliers, super freaks, glamazons. The people um, have historically always found a refuge in fashion who didn't fit in in a more conventional work environment. Right, Freddie Lieber? You know what I'm talking about, darling. So um, uh, that was my vision of fashion. That's how I've always experienced it. And that was why I always liked it. That's why it was always great. So I looked at the landscape described in The Devil Wears Prada. And it's just all these horrible, overachieving girls who think like wearing high heels is like makes you fashionable. So I thought, I don't get it. And the, the fashion editor seemed like a very unnuanced character to me, just flinging her coat like Caligula, you know. <laughs> Like, the fashion editors are a lot more interesting and multifaceted and idiosyncratic and eccentric than that. So, in other words, I thought she sort of dumbed it down, and, and it didn't speak to me. So, two years after the book came out, I got a phone call, and this woman said, we're auditioning for a, a major motion picture of The Devil Wears Prada, and we want you to audition for the role of Nigel. And suddenly, all my disdain for the book just sort of fell away. <laughs> And melted, and I grabbed my little dog, Liberace, and I said, oh my God, we're going to claw our way to the top. We're gonna, this is going to be our moment in the spotlight in a major motion picture. And uh, did I have any misgivings about acting, you know, being able to act? No, because I've always thought any idiot could do that, right? Movie acting. Movie acting seems like the most unbelievable. That's why children could do it. That's why Shirley Temple could do it. Any idiot can be a movie actor. Stage acting, pro you know, more complex. Like if you were Laurence Olivier and you had to do Othello one night and Macbeth the next, right? Hello, that's major. But just hitting your mark and farting out your lines and redoing it. And any idiot can do that. So I didn't have any misgivings about that. My one misgiving about it was... Um, I thought, you know, Nigel, the character in the book, remember Nigel? The, he's sort of a helpful homo, and I have never been helpful. I'm not a helpful homo. You know, when that, that um, show, the uh, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy came out, I had no idea. what. I didn't understand what was going on. I thought, why are these queens rushing around in a van, zhushing up these straight men? Like, when I see a straight guy with, like, a mullet and a Metallica t-shirt, I think, okay, fine. He's a straight guy. I don't have the urge to cut his hair off and put him in a, in a little J. Crew outfit. Like, I'm just not a helpful homo. So I thought, I'm going to have to work on that. So, and then the next, <laughs> um, so I had my date for my audition, and the night before I called my dad, and he was in his 80s, he, bought, you know, he fought in the Second World War, he was this great old geezer, and I said, you're not going to believe this, I'm auditioning for a major motion picture starring opposite Meryl Streep. And there was a pause, and he said, 
well, they must be, they're really scraping the barrel if they called you. And he's always been the wind beneath my wings. And so, uh, you know, after I put down the phone, I thought, well, he does have a point. You know, why are they calling somebody whose um, entertainment industry credits are limited to three fairly disastrous appearances on America's Next Top Model, talking heads on VH1. You know, I'm not except, but then I thought, hey, that's not my problem. So I showed up at the audition, bright-eyed, early. I thought, I'm going to be like Barbara Stanwyck, you know, very polite to everybody, very efficient, early. I'm not going to let booze and dope and ego tear me apart and become part of the Hollywood nightmare. I'm going to be very efficient, just like Barbara Stanwyck. So I was early, and I did my audition. I windmilled my arms and did this sort of pastiche of a fashionista that I thought they kind of wanted. And this woman, the casting director, came screaming towards me with her arms open and she said you're incredible you must come back and meet the director as soon as possible so lights camera action I thought my god this is really happening she handed me this script with post-its in it what bits I had to learn and then I went home and, and started learning big chunks of the dialogue which was an odd kind of process because I found that like, the complicated bits of dialogue were quite easy to remember, and the little bits like, no, thank you, or um, yes, I'd love to, like those things were much harder to remember, and I started remember, I remembered how Marilyn Monroe, you know, in, when they were making Some Like It Hot, she had to do like 50 takes on the line, hey, it's me, sugar, and she kept screwing it up and saying, hey, it's me, sugar, and hey, it's sugar me, and they had to tape the line on the chest of drawers, and so I thought, oh, well, now I get it, why well, she was screwing that up. So I went to the audition, and uh, the second audition with the director, and did my thing, read my lines, and the director said, great, great. And then he started asking me about Anna Wintour, you know, what she really liked, and I said, well, she's nothing like the character in the book. She's actually very straightforward and, and incredibly well-liked by her employees. She's an exemplary mother. You know, she's, she's achieved her success through being incredibly pragmatic. You know, I've never even heard her raise her voice. You know, she, anyway, so he glazed over completely because that wasn't what he wanted to hear. So I thought, okay, we've st I've stayed too long and don't want to bother the director. So I rushed out of the room, and as I'm leaving the casting office, I run into Philip Block. Philip Block is, a like me, a sort of fashion commentator, a telly Nelly, you know, and he, he said to me, um, oh, I'm auditioning for the part of Nigel and blah, 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 and I looked at him like mob wives. I will cut you, bitch. If you get my part, I will come at you. I'm going to come at you and cut you you get my part. But then I thought, he's never going to get it because I'm English and Nigel was English. And so I'm like there with the accent and everything. So the next morning, Liberace and I are, um, I'm pooping him on the sidewalk and it's taking a while. And I run into Robert Verdi and Robert Verdi said to me, oh, I'm exhausted. I've just been auditioning for the part of Nigel. I thought, oh, Jesus Christ, what's going on? And Liberace, I dropped, as I was dropping his poop into the trash can, he looked at me, and the expression on my dog's face was sort of like, you've been had. <laughs> and I realized at that moment that um, me and the other Telly Nellies had been part of some carefully orchestrated bit of free research for some overpaid A-list actor, probably straight, who's gonna get this part. And two days later, they announced that it was Stanley Tucci playing Nigel. So, but you know, time's a great healer. As you can tell, I've moved on. And the, the healing has begun. And I thought, what would Anna do? Anna would just put on her glasses, rise above it, and, and let it go. And that's what I'm gonna do. No, seriously, I'm letting it go. <laughs> All right, thank you. That was my little story. So applause would be appropriate. <laughs>
And there are many more hilarious stories in here. Now, do you want Q&A, darling? All right, so Q&A for how long? It's 10 o'clock now. Followed by book signing. Okay, what time's the second talk? Oh, well, fabulous. All right, so Q&A girls, bombard me with questions. You in the red wig, hair. <laughs> Beautiful red hair. You look great. J'adore. Oh. <laughs> The most important fashion photographer today. Um, I don't think there is one. I think there's like a bunch of people. I think that the era when there were one or two people, like a Mizell or an Avedon, um, I think now there's a whole tier of people from, you know, Miles Aldridge, Inez and Vinut. Um, there's a, a ton of, of um, great people. I mean, um, Mario, Mario Testino. I would, I, it would be very hard to pull one name out, but I think you could do that in the past. You know, Avedon was the top of the heap for such a long time, and then Stephen Mizell, but now it's like, we're lucky. We live, the, the fashion landscape is much bigger than it used to be, obviously. It's an obvious statement, but it really is so bit much bigger than anyone could ever have imagined it. So, when I started in fashion, it was a tiny little universe of people that all sort of knew each other. And now it's a vast landscape that is, is basically incomprehensible because it's so huge. So if ever you hear anybody saying they understand it and here's what it's about, they're lying because it's so vast. There's a million voices on the fashion landscape. It's actually a very exciting time to be involved in fashion because it's so vast and chaotic and multifaceted before it was this small little world I guess no I mean I think it's just a well when in the 80s you couldn't sell a movie or a TV show even in the 90s if it had a fashion component it just didn't sell people didn't get it, it seemed elitist people didn't understand it and then now it's hard to sell an idea if it's not got some style component. So the culture has shifted and evolved and there's a broader interest in fashion. And I think more than the internet, celebrity. Celebrity has made people excited and interested in the idea of fashion. And they don't understand it in such a nuanced way as maybe we used to, but they, they're excited about the idea of shoes and bags and frocks and you know, the general public I'm talking about. And they get a lot of that information about celebrity and fashion through the internet, so yes. Oh my God, so many questions. Um, well, I grew up in a very squalid, gnarly little town and when I left college, my mom said to my sister and me, you have to get a job. So my sister went to a factory and put tops on aerosol cans, and I got a job in demolition. Yeah. <laughs> Dem demolishing public toilets with this demolition crew. Because there wasn't any question back then of your dream and following your dream. That didn't exist back then. So it was like you, your dream was getting a job and contributing to the household income. So... I got fired eventually off the demolition crew and I was walking home and this friend of mine who subsequently became a very famous transvestite cabaret performer worked in the local department store, which is a local little ratty department store. And I went in there and got a job there and I was working on the clocks and watches. And he and I were very into fashion, which at that time was glam rock, Bowie, Roxy Music, all that stuff. So. Um, we were obsessed with moving to London and, and having a fabulous time and da-da-da-da-da. But it wasn't career 
oriented. It was more like, I want to be there at that Bowie concert wearing my Mr. Freedom jumpsuit and whatever. So we weren't really careerist. We had really low expectations, but we were excited about the idea of fashion. But basically, I've always been in retail. So people, young people say, oh, well, how did you get your start? They think that I, like, you know, went up to Diana Vreeland somewhere and put her in a headlock and made her give me a job. <laughs> My generation, it was more like baby steps. I mean, I'm 61. You know, I worked in retail. So it's like, I'm not very helpful to young people today because my journey was one of just getting a crappy job, getting a less crappy job, getting a less crappy job, getting a less crappy job, until I ended up, you know, working at Maxfield in LA. And then from there, I got my job at Barney's where I've been for 27 years. So it's not, it's actually not very exciting. I don't have any big Shazam to give young people. I've just had some very good opportunities which came my way and I grabbed them at different points. It's not helpful, I'm sorry. Is it helpful? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> oh, the lady in the beautiful red hair. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, <laughs> well, if I was a store, I would, because it's important now in the, I mean, my title, I was, I was creative director for a long time, and now I'm creative ambassador, which is exactly that kind of image thing that you're talking about. If I had a business, I would have two or three people that were like that, that were visible, that people always talk to bloggers. That, that seems like an important thing now. And various stores do have them, like Linda Fargo at Bergdorf, and she has a lot of visibility. So I think, yeah, I would if I was <clears throat> running a company. I don't know whether they'll figure it out. Maybe I'll be the only one. Young man? <laughs> oh, well, retail is all about evolution, and Barney's is a great example. In 1923, it was a tiny little store telling, selling discounted menswear, one minute little tiny store downtown. You know, cut to now, it's a global, international signifier of designer, glamour, sophistication, humor, wit, art. Um, so it's gone through many evolutions. And in my 27 years, even during that period, it's gone through many evolutions. And, and it's important for that in retail. It has to be dynamic. It has to evolve. And... Um, you know, in, when I got there in 1985, Barney's was in the middle of establishing itself as a destination for women. And we opened the big store on 17th Street, and Peter Marino and Andre Putman designed it. How did you remember? It was very great. And um, back then, the fa fashion was a smaller universe, and so, it, you know, the store was set up a certain way. We had real antique furniture, blah, blah, blah. Now, it's, um, now, as of three years ago, Mark Lee is our CEO, and he's a brilliant guy who's worked with Armani, Jill Sander, Valentino, Gucci, and he has completely renovated most of our stores, especially Madison Avenue. Um, we have a new creative director. When he said to me, listen, you've been creative director for 25 years. We need a new creative director. And I said, you're right. Why would you have the same person as creative director for that long? So, hi, Joan Quinn. Morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm like Dame Edna, just embarrassing. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, and now the current vision of Barney's comes from 
Mark Lee, Daniela Vitali. Um, it's, it's, I'm so glad to be there and be part of the excitement that's going on there now. Um, so it's great. Change is good. I'm not change resistant. I think it's because I'm an immigrant. I'm a scrappy little immigrant. Young man with holding up his, whatever you're holding up. Well, Scotland should, uh, deserves to and should fit into the current scene in an even bigger way than it already does. I mean, um, as, a, as a Brit, I'm very aware of the mills, the history, the heritage of Scottish product, all the incredible stuff that, that has come from and continues to come from Scotland. And I think it, it should be even more than it is now. So it's like well-deserved and... Somebody should turn up the volume even louder on Scotland because it's so incredible, those fabrics that come from those mills and that are used around the world. And maybe, I think, what, if you want to get people excited about craft and that kind of heritage awareness, it's a lot of work. You know, in the landscape where people are so focused on celebrity, you know, and, and sort of show busy aspect of fashion, the red carpet aspect of fashion, to get people excited about a mill in Scotland where they weave mink into the cashmere and all the incredible stuff that's done there. Um, you have to really work at it because people tend to like, regular people, the nuances of it could elude people. So, but, um, you know, you have good ambassadors, someone like Gerald Butler, um, Tilda Swinton, you know, still has her house in Scotland. I love Scotland. I'm pro. My mum's name was Gordon. She considered herself Scottish. So, does that was that helpful? I'm always terrified now. I'm not being helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Are you from Scotland? Yes. Mazel Tov. <laughs> <laughs> Young lady? Yeah. What city? You're asking the wrong person. I have no vision at all. I'm like completely useless at that stuff. When the internet came along, um, I remember we had a meeting at Barney's about it in the 90s, and I said, this is so stupid. Who's going to sit at a computer all day <laughs> looking at nonsense and, and then buying clothes on the, online? What a retarded notion. No one's going to do that. And I said, especially not expensive shoes and bag. Who's going to buy that online? now? forget it. We, we should run an ad in the New York Times. We do not have a website. And, and like... <laughs> It's just never going to happen. Women are always going to want to try things on, touch them. Blah, blah. I'm an idiot. So I don't have any vision. So was that being helpful or unhelpful? <laughs> it was a bit of both. bit of both. Young man? Women's accessories are more demented and out through that we have to keep renovating our store to put in more women's accessories. So I don't know which on journal you're reading. Well, maybe they're talking about um, the, see, I only know about the top of the business, the middle of the business, which is where all the real huge amount of businesses, you mean Macy's, Nordstrom, that kind of thing. Their, their numbers might be off a bit, but their numbers are so huge anyway in accessories. They might be talking about trends. But, I mean, I can't believe how many bags women buy. And I even wrote an article about it for the New York Observer because Freud, Sigmund Freud said that women's purses were vaginal symbols. 
So if you dreamt about a purse, it was a vaginal symbol, which if you think about it, is, makes a lot of sense. It's secret, it's clothes, a woman always has it next to her. So they are a vaginal representation. So in this article, I speculated about what, that would, what Freud would make of this insane thing where, because um, you remember when bags in the 80s were not a big category. You know, girls like Marion Greenberg just wore their beautiful Cob de Garçon. You weren't carrying like 15,000 different purses. It was like a tote or a nylon back, Prada backpack. That was the beginning of... Now it's like, it's insane. Like, well, it's great for retailers. But like the, back to your question, I think the numbers are still incredibly major, especially online, accessories, bags. Maybe there's some trending up and down, and men's, to your point, is a growing thing for us at Barney's, man bags. Mm -hmm. I wonder what Freud would have made of that. <laughs> Young man? Well, men's is not necessarily about being new or interesting or engaging. Like, I think menswear is like, I always think of this incredible exhibit that Richard Martin did at FIT in the 80s called Jocks and Nerds. And he broke down the archetypes of men's style into biker, jock, nerd, um, cow, western, um, outlaw, you know, and he broke it down into these archetypes. And this, it, this catalog, if you love menswear, go online and buy Jocks and Nerds, this catalog from that exhibit, because it's still very much the case that people don't deviate from those, from those categories. You're a prep, or you're a biker, or you're whatever. But um, there are certain people that always try to break through that. I'd say Ricardo Tisci, Givenchy menswear, so he tries to, to do new things. But it's hard to do new things when the vast majority of men just want whatever it is fits into their archetype. So men, men and women are going through a completely different process when they adorn themselves, when they think about fashion. And there's a growing number of men that will think a bit more like women. They want a new, they buy it by labels, but it's still not comparable business-wise. Women's is still a huge part of it. Young lady with... Uh, <laughs> I haven't got my glasses on. <laughs> But it's okay. uh, Armani is Armani's inspiration. I think was basically cinematic, you know, from Clark Gable. Like he went back to, um, you know, the sort of idea of these cinematic icons who were in beautifully tailored suits, and then he tried to make it softer. That was the, the springboard of his career, to take British tailoring, which historically was very stiff, and give a fluidity to it, online jackets and blah, blah, blah. So I think his came from that world. And then, of course, he's added to it because he's been in business such a long time. But cinematic kind of matinee idol. Blonde lady? It's everything focused. Like I said, the landscape's so huge. Bill Cunningham, about 10 years ago, I was outside Barney's in and out doing the windows, and I said to Bill Cunningham, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the fashion landscape. And he said, don't even bother. He said, it's so chaotic and so vast and so multifaceted. But in a way, he said, fashion, I remember everything he says, because he's always, there's this great story about Bill Cunningham in the book, because he and I collaborated once. I won't spoiler alert for you, but Bill said, fashion is doing its job, it's reflecting the culture. And the culture is very chaotic and multifaceted and vast, and so fashion is just reflecting culture. So there's everything in fashion. There's purists like Rick Owens, and then there's right through to H&M, Zara. Everything is currently available, so it's very hard to nail it down. Some people are very into art inspiration. I'm sort of a bit dubious about that. I think for fashion, it's great to have art, you know, 
art collaborations are fun, like the Kusama thing at Vuitton was great. But I don't think it serves the interests of art. I think it's it's a bit corroding for art. So I'm always like, hey, you know, you want to collaborate with with us? Come play with us, great. But if I was an artist, I probably wouldn't because I think it's... I often say this to artists. Over the years, artists have... You know, I've collaborated with a lot of artists, put their work in the window, but I'm very judicious about what I put in because if somebody does beautiful paintings and you stick them in a window with a mannequin in a frock, you've already devalued, degraded that person's art. And I'll say to them, no, your art isn't right for this environment. It'll look like a panel that I bought in a display warehouse downtown. So only certain things work, like, for example, John Chamberlain, John Chamberlain mangled up car sculpture. That would work in a window. But some, anything that's refined or thoughtful needs to be in a gallery. A store window is not the right context for a lot of art. So, and I think with the Kusama thing, which I thought was great for Louis Vuitton, I'm not sure what it, how it did for her, what it was like for her, the brilliant artist, fascinating artist who lives in a mental asylum, interestingly. Kusama, um, I thought well, this must be bewildering for her because she's walking through Selfridges in London. There's a million people tearing at these wallets who have no idea they're looking at art or an art collaboration. I think the art world's a bit of a bubble and it's a bit of an echo chamber, so they don't necessarily able to think both ways. But, you know, it's always interesting to see what's going on in the art world. Young lady with the glasses. Um, I'm more of a carny. You know, like, I definitely think of myself that way. Like, people say, oh, you're an artist too. And I say, no, I'm not. Like, get it? I'm not. I... I'm, um, I think of my work in more like, um, my window display work in the past was more like street theater. Um, it was more like Coney Island. I always wanted to communicate and connect with people. So I would always think, well, what are people excited about? And then I think Warhol. There's two documentaries come out about Warhol. Va values are escalating. This is the year we'll do a war holiday. Get it? So I would only do that when I thought Warhol was having some kind of peak general interest. We did a foodie holiday at Barney's because I felt like our customers were becoming increasingly obsessed with food and chefs and celebrity chefs. Like it, it's been going on for a couple of decades, but it was reaching some kind of insane apotheosis. So I thought this is the year to do a foodie holiday. So I'm more like, um, um, yeah, I see my, I'm much, the fashion insiders actually have a very hard time thinking that way. They're more like, well, what, do, what am I interested in? What am I interested in? I'm more like, what are you interested in? And how can I interpret that in a hip way that's intriguing and sort of ping it back to you? The way, the way people would in a newspaper or a magazine, we need to write an article about so-and-so because people there's a growing obsession with it or something like that. So... No, I, I'd rather be me and be a carny than be an artist, because that would be very limiting to me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Lisa.